as um, I don't have one on this slide, but I could share with you later if you want. On the social business model canvas, you would find that there's a section for the payer, there's a section for the user, which could also be the beneficiary. So most nonprofit businesses in Nigeria, Africa countries, as you know, focused on on extracting payments from the payers, which are the which are primarily the donors. But these are not the only payers that you can have. You provide services to the beneficiaries, and many people are focused on just extracting payment from the donors. However, the donors cannot sustain your business operations. You need a you need a steady flow of income to fund your business operations which most donors would not cover because they want to just cover your payment for your programs and you don't want to read the many in the same spots because the world is evolving at a very rapid pace the same way the way your industry is last five years is not the same way it is today and it's not going to be the same way in the next three to five years so that means that you want to grow you want to expand you want to improve on your processes improve on the way you do things and if donors are not paying for your operations costs, how would you fund that cost? How would you even survive? Not to talk of even growing or expanding. So that is why you need to identify another set of payers that can give you a steady flow of income. And that is where you get to um, having another revenue stream. So now I'm just gonna show you an example of what is going on in the for-profit um, industry so that you see why you also, as a business leader in the nonprofit space, needs to um, align more toward the social enterprise business model. If you look at the far left of this slide, you see for-profit businesses, and in the middle, you see social enterprises, in the far right, you see nonprofit businesses. So what exactly is this? The for-profit businesses exist solely to make profit, right? They don't care about impacts. But in the last 50 years, as a result of global warming, results of environmental pollution, you know, reducing natural resources, increasing population, business leaders have global businesses have global business leaders have found that we cannot keep extracting profit from the from the planet, from the people without giving back. And as a result of this, they decided and say, okay, look, we are gonna make profits, but the same way we still want to do some good. That's why you have them improving their CS, their corporate social responsibility policies. That's why you have them incorporating ES, uh, ESG in their accounting practices. That's why you have them making, you know, accounting policies that allows them to cost for energy and seeing the cost of them polluting the environment so that they can give back to the environment, into the, into the community. So my question for you as a, as, as, as a, a non-profit manager or let's say leader is that if for-profit businesses are entering into the impact sector to create some good as they're making profits, don't you think that we who are focused primarily on making impact also need to align a little bit towards the left so that we can make enough money to create better impact and sustain ourselves. Because we need to in the long run, we don't want to be the rickety old nonprofit company that cannot even afford to put AC in the organization and you know, afford to create an environment that is conducive even for employees. So that's why in the next slide, you see that in the recent years, non-profit um, managers and executives have begun to realize the need to align a little bit toward the left just to make, to make enough money to keep them growing. That means as you're making, as, you, as you're focusing on creating impact through charitable programs, you also need to begin to maximize the strategic capabilities within your processes, within your your, your your organization to extract payment from other people that can pay for those for those 
capabilities, for those solutions that you can create. So as they pay for those solutions, then you can afford to meet your present need and also continue, you know, and also have a, have a business that is going to be um, self-sustaining in the next 50 years. Because in business, it's very important that you have, um, you, you, you have a, let me say, a, a, policy that, let me, a policy that allows that, that is built on, on long-term survival. No business founder wants to start a business that's going to shut down in 20 years. You want to have a business that exists in a century. You want to have a non-profit business that will be able, that will be self-sustaining even when you're not there, even when you, you're retired and someone else is there. So this is why it's important for non-profits and business leaders, policymakers in this space to begin to develop alternative business alternative revenue stream in order, to, in order to meet your need. So I just want to be sure that everyone is understanding what I'm saying. You know, I know you have questions, but uh, am I making sense? Hello? Hello everyone, is it making sense? This is where you respond. It's making yes. brain. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you for the feedback. Yes. So, so it is. It is. Um, it is important that we also find, you know, that um, that that area of our business where we can extract value for the thing that we are very good at. In every business, there is something, or let me say, let me. Say, Say so there should be something that you're very good at that cannot be easily cannot be, cannot be easily replicated by someone else. This is your strategic capability. And when you identify this thing within your business and you find the people who are willing to pay for it, then you can charge enough money from them to offset the areas where your donors cannot cover. So when you identify your niche, the place where you're very good at, then you're just you're, you're, you're on the path to improving your business model. So in my next slide, I just outlined the steps that you can take to build an innovative business model. And it starts from identifying that niche where you are different from everybody else. You know, the niche where you do something that other people in your industry cannot, you know, do not have. What, make, what makes your donor come to you every time? Why do your beneficiaries attend your sessions every time? So when you find out these things, then you ask yourself the question, who else can pay for this thing? Who else needs it and can pay for it? So after they find this thing, this is where your pricing strategy comes in. So that you want to do good, yes, but you also want to survive and grow. So you could decide that, okay, I'm going to make profits on this particular service that I'm doing, and I'm going to return in my profits into my business to provide interventions for people who cannot afford the service. You can decide to have two sets of customers to set of customers yeah, The first one can be your beneficiary who do not pay for your products. The second set of people can be your, cost your, your customers who are paying customers who pay for your products. You can decide to say, okay, you guys are gonna ben benefit from my, from, my, from my service, from my products, but I want you to pay some parts of this money yourself. So that's where you decide to say, okay, beneficiaries are gonna come up with 45% of the costs. 20% of the cost, and I'm going to raise the other parts of the cost from donors. So when you do this, you can ensure that you're meeting your operating costs while putting the program costs on the donors. And then the other step is where reinvestment comes in. 
because as a nonprofit, you are a trustee of public donations. And then and on the other side, you're also established primarily to improve the society, not to make profits, not for profit maximization, but to create impact. So even if you are making profits after adopting the social enterprise model, you need to have a financial management policy that, that is that caters to the financial allocation of your revenue. That is after you have met your operating costs, after you have met your program costs, and you have some money left. How do you reallocate this, this money, which is called reserve? How do you reallocate this reserve into your business so that you can begin, you can put it into the areas where you need to expand or you want to improve your, your, your you want to improve on the kind of talent you have and define, should we invest this money into technology? Should we invest this money into training? Should we acquire, you know, should we, should we start a new program? Should we get a bigger space? This is where financial management comes in. And as you grow into this, as you apply this model and grow, you find that you need someone in that area. And so the results of doing this is business growth. Because as you do this, you would, you would discover that you are getting better in your strategic capabilities. You are getting better at that thing that differentiates you. On the other hand, you're developing a closer relationship with your donors, with your beneficiaries and your customers. So this makes you very relevant in the industry. It makes you very um, unique in your industry. And as you apply sound financial management um, principles in your organization, you're going to find that you're making, you're making effective financial decisions that allows you to that allows you to grow over time. So while doing all of these, it is also important to keep sustainability as a focus because it's it is um, it has become very evident now that every resources available to a business, whether non-profit or for-profit, which includes the environment, people, and financial resources, it needs to be managed in such a way that it would be available for future generations to use. So an example is this, as a business, uh, as a, let me say, as a manager in your, in your firm, you have a capital of, let's say, 20 million right now, you have five people, you have, a, you have office space. How are you managing these resources in a way such that by the next 10 years, the next person that succeeds you as a business, as the manager in that organization would have sufficient resources to grow? How are you managing your, your resources, your people such that the people that succeed you would have the right, would have the best people still working in that organization, or would be able to attract the best talents. How are you reallocating the money that you make in such a way that in the future you can take from your own financial reserve and start a program even without the help of a donor? So these are policies that need to be incorporated into your into your practices. Continue giving back to the to the, to the community. Continue investing in your people. Incorporate financial ethical policies that ensures that every penny is being tracked and every money is being managed well. So I'm just going to stop here today because uh, you know we didn't have a lot of time to but I know you have questions and then please, um, if you have any questions, let me know. I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, um, Kola, for that brief but extremely important conversation he just raised. Um, I think you may want to leave, maybe you share a copy of your presentation with us, or you may want to leave it on the screen in case anyone has a question referencing your presentation. But he has spoken about some very important things, um, which I think could serve as a, a sort of to-do list or guiding principle for us in the coming, in this month of June, and then, of course, 
the subsequent months. Number one, how are you reinvesting? So how are you generating and how are you re redistributing wealth within your organization? Not just wealth in people, but also financial wealth. You know, uh, many of us know how to access money, save money, but we are not intentional about reinvesting those resources, especially for our organizations and not just ourselves, right? Our organizations, what investments have you bought? What shares have you bought on behalf of your nonprofit? Do you have a financial advisor? I know some of you would say we've not, we've barely made enough resources. How much more we are now thinking about investment, but he's extremely correct because investments can be a way of paying some of your staff salaries. I've, I've shared this here before that while I worked with Wimbis, we paid us, our salaries were paid from the resources we generated from our conference. So when the conference happens in November, they lock the money down in three months, break it to pay salaries, just like that. And we were, you know, just keeping afloat. So he has shared just so many important things. Thank you so much once more, Kola. I want to hand over to everyone else who has a question, contribution, addition to the conversation. Um, the floor is yours now. Um, he's here to take any of your questions. Or if you just like to share what you're doing internally, um, now is the time to please share. Thank you. Good evening, Kola. Um, thank you very much. My name is TJ. Um, I run an NGO. I think I'm the youngest in this class. Uh, Chidi, don't laugh at me. I know I'm the youngest, and I know I'm the youngest. Thank God you know I'm <laughs> laughing. <laughs> okay, so Chidi, um, I was in and out of the presentation, so I want to just ask if as uh, a non-for-profit, did you say we can have programs where people can pay for um, that we run that generates income, one, or can we have the investments that we make from the money you know, we raise? Um, uh, it, it, does any of those two fly? Okay. Uh, all right, so you can have programs that are primarily for, let me say, for um, non fee paying beneficiaries. And at the same time, you can have programs that beneficiaries would be required to pay a percentage of the program, maybe fee and you can raise the remaining money from donors. At the same time, you can also have a different revenue stream from your traditional programs. This can be consulting. This can be um, publishing. You can create, you can develop materials that provide experts insights on your industry that even private sector organizations may not have because you have a deeper relationship with the grassroots community so this there are several ways you can you can um, you can maximize you can extract a um, payment for for your services i hope this answers your question so yes it does I just want to add if um, including um, probably some form of partnership with a for-profit organization to achieve some of that is also another win. Um, case in point, we have, um, I, I do a lot of uh, social work for teenagers and we want to get um, an organization who would run the, uh, as technical partners to run the program and then there's some form of payments needed, you know, extend for an extension of the program. Could that also be seen as another stream for income? Okay, so depending on the structure of your partnership with a, a profit making organization, the ability for or for you, of the your ability to extract, you know, payment for services would vary. If you are providing a 
if you're providing, let me say, uh, an expertise to your for profit partner that only you as a non profit can provide. Maybe you have a technical expertise in an area where they are looking to do some good and you are charging for these. That's a way of making of re making revenue because you have an expertise in that area, they need a local expertise to solve a problem. And if they are willing to pay you for it, there's no problem about that. It's just understanding the intention of your partner, understanding your own goal and finding a balance between your desire to your your intention to 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 uh, to earn revenue and their own intention to meet their own business goals. So it's like you're exchanging values. You are giving them your expertise in a particular area and they are paying you to provide impact for beneficiaries. I'm not going to back here, right? Um, TJ, in addition to what he has shared, the truth remains. I um, just never forget that the difference between a for profit company and a non profit is that when a for profit company declares profit at the end of the year or becomes profitable, you know, they are allowed to probably uh, buy cars for all their board members. Um, do all the extra trimmings that they feel would be beneficial to the organization. But for us nonprofits, irrespective of the amount of money we generate, either through conferences, paid programs, paid trainings, um, charging a fee for whatever consulting work you're doing, whatever way or motor you use to raise resources for your organization, the money is plowed back into the nonprofits. The money is not used to buy a, a new house for your board member. The money can be used to purchase a new building for your work. As long as everything you're doing is for the nonprofit, then that revenue income stream is, is seen, is permitted, it's okay. You know, um, I don't want to start going to the nitty gritty, but for, for our other profit making brothers and sisters, they can use this, their profit as they deem fit. But for us, the way we draw the line is that the money must be plowed back into the nonprofit. You buy a car in the name of the nonprofit. You, you build you build a house in the name of the nonprofit. You buy a property in the name of the nonprofit. That's a, a major distinguishing factor between us and the for-profit making industry. It doesn't mean you cannot um, charge for your services. It doesn't mean you cannot um, work with private partners or consulting work or things like that. Your accountant will know how to prepare your books in such a way that it records that this is a donation that was used for X, Y, Z causes or X, Y, Z reasons. So I hope that helps as well. Yes, thank you very much for that. I think it gives uh, balance. Uh, so the profit comes back basically to fund um, the needs of the organization. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah. You see why I'm the youngest in the class? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Does anyone else have any more questions for Kola or would like to Hi. share? Yes, please go ahead. Hi, GB. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Kola. Great session. So my question is, um, I've heard about um, things evolving the world. So why do nonprofits registration any longer as opposed to social enterprise registration? So ab initio, you know you're going, um, you already know that um, some of the services will not be, will be charged at a particular rate. So as of today, I'm saying based on the evolution of the space and everything, is it not more um, mindful if we're just going to go into registering a, this, a, a an organization to register a, social enterprise as opposed to a non-profit thanks okay hi okay so your questions are you know they're very they're very important questions and the reason why non-profit businesses will still be relevant even in the next 200 let me say 100 years is because of the governance structure and for-profit businesses have a different governance structure, different objectives. Just like Judy mentioned earlier, they are established primarily 
to maximize profit for their shareholders. That's why they pay dividends. They pay in they pay dividends to shareholders and all of these things. However, the non-profit registration, uh, let me say, let me the number of which is established to provide um let me services that improves the community or the planet of people without the aim of making profits. So if you if you follow the if you decide to register as a limited liability company for, for profit, you find that you will be limited in providing social impact um, interventions. Why? Because you're going to have shareholders, except you want to be the only one running your business and you cannot fund your business that way. So you, you're going to have shareholders that are going to be demanding profits growth every year because they want to get dividend for their investments. You want to grow, you would have to maybe go public on the stock exchange. However, as a non-profit, you can make profits and still use this to improve the community. Your trustees are not going to ask you for profits. No, they're only going to ensure that you're spending the money, you're locating your finances in the right position, and they are different depending on your aim. Depending on your aim, you can choose, you can choose to, to be a limited liability company. If your aim is to make profit primarily, you can go that route and say, okay, well, I still want to do some good. So I will do social, I will do impact. So that makes you social enterprise. Or you can say, I want to be primarily a non-profit business. At the same time, I want to stay alive and also grow in the next 50 to 100 years. So the foundations are different. Oh, that explains it. Thanks. Uh, yeah, subtle. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you so much, Paula, for that. Any more questions? Any more questions, questions, questions? If there are no more questions, I think we did really good with time. Um, this is six o'clock, literally. And that was the intention to make it simple and straight to the point. Uh, you've said quite a lot, and my only I hope many of us will actually move forward from all the things we've been assimilating to actually implementing. If you attempt to implement, then you will have a lot of questions that you can always bring back to the group. I want to encourage, encourage us again. This is the month of June. Please go back and look at your mission and your vision. Go back and look at your goals. Are you, are we just, or are you just um, sitting around and waiting for what to happen? Or are you deliberately, intentionally pursuing those goals? If you don't pursue, you won't know how, how well you're doing or how much you are accomplishing. Um, so I really want to encourage us, uh, try and increase your engagement in the groups, try and increase your, increase your engagement with our activities, try and be involved with the process. The year is fast coming to an end. The inner circle is fast coming to an end. I would not want you to leave the inner circle and at the end of the day, it's just another program that you had paid for, but you did not get maximum value from. Um, our new course is going to be released next week. Um, I think Monday or Tuesday, I'm not sure. But the new course is going to be released next week for the month. I encourage you all to please, please, please implement, implement, implement. That is the only difference between you and another organization. I'm going to ask one more time if anyone has a question, contribution, and if no other person does, um, thank you all so much for joining tonight from your busy schedules. Thank you so much, Kola, for taking the time out to engage this process and um, share with us such an enlightening session. We're also going to put up the presentation in the resource part of the platform and hopefully they can all download from there and read up in their private time. If you have more questions, please put it in the group and we are going to answer your questions in the group. On that note, thank you all so much. Have yourself a lovely evening. Um, stay blessed. Um, sorry, Barista. Yeah, you joined late. <laughs>
Okay, guys. Take care, all of you. Take care, guys. Bye. Yes, the recording will be shared. Yeah, you get the copy much. of the recording as soon as it's available. Thank you once more, Paula. Well, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you, Chidi. Thank you, Paula. Bye. You're welcome. Bye, Jay. Bye, everyone.